All right, so fluids, um, let's go. All right, so first we have to define some basic properties of fluids and what we define as a fluid uh, before we move forward. Because a lot of people think fluid is just like water or liquids. But in reality, fluids are anything that can flow. So all of the properties, or most of the properties anyway, that we'll talk about today, we can also apply to gases. Um, they have volumes. They flow freely. Uh, they can be moved around. Uh, the one major difference between what we'll be talking about in fluids, as in liquids versus gases, is that liquids are not compressible. You can't force liquid into a smaller area, or not substantially. So when you apply a force on a liquid, that force doesn't move the liquid, it's transferred through the liquid. So for us, the other liquid properties, first, incompressible, like I said. <clears throat> That's why we can use things like um, hydraulics to lift cars up or move heavy equipment. We're going to assume that they flow very, very smoothly, uh, what we call laminar flow. In reality, Fluids are very turbulent. If you were to see like water flowing in a stream, uh, if that fluid goes around a rock, it creates a little vortex on the other side of the rock. You've probably all seen that before. If you put a leaf in there, it kind of gets trapped behind a rock because the water's flowing around the rock and it creates a swirl behind it. We're not going to deal with any of those things. We're just talking about the very basics of fluid flow. So we're going to assume that all of our flow is very, very smooth. There's no vortexes. There's no uh, otherwise uh, turbulent uh, behavior. We're also going to assume that most of our liquids, or all of our liquids rather, are constant density. The density is not going to change based on where you are in the fluid. Kind of easy one to understand. Uh, all our liquids are going to be normal liquids. They're not going to be super fluids or anything crazy like that. At really low temperatures, fluids kind of get all weird on us. Um, but they all conform to their container, and they all seek their own level. And uh, we're going to demonstrate this in a second. This is why you can siphon things. Because fluids always want to be at the same level as any other fluid which it's connected to. So you're not going to have a fluid. Um, you're not going to have a fluid. That doesn't work. Uh, one part of the fluid is and the other part of the fluid is there. Fluids are continuous. This is a very stupid example. You see a fluid, it's obviously going to flow and you know, fix its own location. But this fluid uh, here and this fluid here are connected to each other via fluid. And so they always seek their own level. Well, in other cases where fluids are connected, let's say you have two containers uh, with a hose between them. If there's fluid in this hose that is connecting these two levels, these fluids are also considered connected as well. So they will always maintain the same water level. So if I were to, say, raise this container upwards, then the water level uh, would try to remain the same as this one. So the fluid would flow to raise the water level of this, and it would eventually overflow. This is the property of a siphon. Which we will show. <coughs> All right, other basic uh, ideas of fluids. Density. Now, density, everybody's done a calculation of density before. You probably did it back in like sixth grade, whenever you start doing division, probably. Uh, density is mass over volume. Now, that looks like a P for density, but it's not. It's a rho. Uh, it doesn't show up really well here. But a rho is a symbol that we use for density. Not a capital D, not a lowercase d, not a P. It's a rho, R-H-O. The density of anything, fluid, solid, anything, uh, is defined by mass over volume, kilograms divided by meters cubed. You know, we're going to be using meters cubed for volumes uh, instead of all the other uh, variants of that. You know, we use meters and kilograms so that we can use newtons later on. Uh, be sure to check on your web assign. They may give you the volume where you have to convert it. They may give it to you in milliliters or something. So just be aware of that. <coughs> We're going to use the density calculation all the time. And not just to calculate density, but to calculate mass uh, of solids and fluids. 
So whenever you don't know uh, the mass of something, always look to see if you're given the density of it, because you can oftentimes calculate the mass with the density. So uh, might be useful just to know this relationship too. Density times volume equals mass, because you use that just as often, if not more often, than you use the top one. We can also calculate the weight of something. Uh, the weight of something on Earth is the mass times its local gravity, g on Earth. If we multiply g on both sides here, we actually can find the weight of a fluid or the weight of a solid just with rho vg. And that's going to come up again in Archimedes. That is Archimedes' principle, rho vg. But it's the rho of the water, volume of the object, and gravity. Get there. Oops. <clears throat> uh, second equation uh, from this chapter is the pressure equation. The base definition of pressure is force over area. Uh, the unit of uh, pressure that we're going to be using is a Pascal. After Pascal, PA. It is a derived unit. A Pascal is a Newton or meter squared. <clears throat> now, the idea of pressure is, is, I think, very, very simple, but you have to understand that as the area goes down, the force stays constant, the pressure goes up. And the easiest way to understand this is to think about high-heeled shoes. Uh, let's say that Connor was walking around. He was wearing his tennis shoes. And Bo's laying on the ground, stretching out. He walks right on top of him, just steps right up on top of him, and then keeps walking on. Well, Bo felt a lot of pressure. And he felt that pressure because Connor was applying a force over the area of his shoe. Now, let's say Connor was wearing high heels. Now he does that same walking, walks straight across Bo while he's, uh, while he's just lying there. Now, did he apply any more force to Bo? No, the same weight, same force. But the area of the applied force was much, much smaller. So it felt like it hurt more because the pressure was greater. Uh, and that's most often the question that you get. What happens to the pressure when the force is doubled and the air or the radius is doubled? Now, if you're talking about a circle, you forget pi r squared. So there's some nuances in those questions. But uh, the base definition of force over area. The smaller the area that the force is applied, the greater the pressure uh, that you exert. If you've ever seen somebody or seen a picture of somebody like laying on a bed of nails, it's the same idea. Uh, a property of pressure that you need to be aware of is that pressure is always normal to surfaces. So if you've got a container and that container is say, filled with a fluid, that fluid is exerting pressure on any area that it's touching. The fluid has got a weight to it, so it's being spread out. It's trying to fill, its, fill up its containers. The pressure that this side experiences is perpendicular to the surface itself. The pressure here, pressure down here is perpendicular. Pressure down here is greater at further depths. At the bottom, perpendicular to the surface. Pressure at all these areas is going to be the same. And on this side, pressure perpendicular to the surface. And it's on every surface that the fluid is touching, not just the bottom. But the fluid is trying to fill its container, so it will push outwards as well. So the pressure is exerted on each wall of the container, and then it's also proportional to the depth. If you think about this equation, then proportional to the depth may make sense. How much water is pushing on this little piece right up here? Well, not much, just that little bit of water. How much water is pushing on this piece down here? Well, quite a bit more, that whole piece of water. How much is pushing down at the bottom? 
that whole piece of water is pushing down the bottom. So the deeper you go, the more force is applied, and therefore the more pressure that you would experience. Uh, atmospheric pressures, uh, for those of you who remember chemistry, you'll remember all kinds of different units that you may have used for atmospheric pressures, including atmospheres or millimeters of mercury. Uh, we are going to be using pascals. Atmospheric pressure is 100,000 pascals. That is standard atmospheric pressure at sea level. Uh, you probably want to go ahead and memorize that number. You're going to be using it quite a bit in problems. Uh, we're going to be using quite a bit in class. So 100,000 pascals is atmospheric pressure. So 1 atm or 760. Any other conversions you guys know from that one? Torus? Is, no. uh, but pascals is what we're using. And once again, look out on WebAssign. They may have you do a conversion or two. Uh, you can just Google the conversion number, or I'm sure it's in the, well, I don't know where to find it. 760 and 1 and 100,000. Those are the three numbers. Uh, the differences in pressure cause cause forces uh, or cause things to change, cause winds to blow. Uh, more importantly in our class, the distant differences in pressure cause forces. If there's one pressure here, one pressure here, those pressures want to equal each other out. It doesn't, you know, nature and that whole equilibrium thing. So if there's two differences in pressures, there's going to be forces which are applied because of those differences. A typical place that you'd see this is on an airplane. So if cabin pressure is 90% of pressure at sea level, external pressure as you go up and up and up goes down and down and down. So suppose that the atmospheric pressure, the external pressure rather, is only 50% of sea level, and the window is 0.43 times 0.3 wide. What is the force on the window? And these are the rudimentary calculations that somebody would actually go through if they were going to design an airplane. You know, I'm sure that much more in depth than that when they start to get finished, but you know, somebody had to have the original idea. So this is what they would go through. So the first thing you ask yourself, is there a force being applied? Yes. If there's a pressure difference, then there's a force being applied. But when we're talking about forces and pressure, so probably a good idea to go here. I want to calculate the net force. So I need to know the pressures, the pressure difference, or which way the pressure is pushing, and the area over which that's pushing. <coughs> so here's your window. And he's got pressure on the outside that's 50% atmospheric. The pressure on the inside is 90% atmospheric. So which way is the force going to be acting? Out this way. The force is going to be acting outwards. It's trying to equalize the pressure. Well, how much force is being applied? 90% of atmospheric. Yeah. 90,000? Why 40,000? Oh, yes, of course. 50%? 50,000. So the difference in the pressures, there's 40,000 pascals of pressure on that window. <laughs> 40,000 pascals of pressure acted over the area, the area being length times width, 0.43 meters times 0.3 meters. The force is somebody have a calculator. Four, three, nine, twelve, four, six, three, eleven, seven. Sixty? Five point six oh? 
five one six one. And the units? What's a Pascal? Newton over meter squared times a meter squared, just a Newton, which is the force, so it should be in Newton. <laughs> and of course, you can take this you know, further on. Once you have a force, you can do all kinds of things. You can, you can have accelerations. You can have changes in velocity. You can do work with forces or find impulse. You know, once you get to the point where you're doing free body diagram, it opens up basically every physics problem that we've done this far. Now there's more logical ones. Like, I don't know, how thick does the glass have to be? But you can see where this is, this is going to kind of go. Um, let's talk about atmospheric pressure before we get to pressure. 